The following lecture was delivered during a Hillsdale College seminar. Hillsdale College is distinguished by its commitment to the liberal arts, Western culture, and the American heritage of freedom. For over 150 years, it has refused federal funding and has admitted students regardless of race, sex, or origin, or of government mandates. If you would like more information about TAPES or about Hillsdale College, call toll-free 1-800-437-2268. Uh, to get back to the program, uh, I've never uh, met before this our next speaker, uh, but I've admired him from afar. Uh, most of us here are old enough to remember uh, when the term civil rights leader evoked admiration. Uh, civil rights are good, uh, for heaven's sake. They're American. Uh, they're what we fight wars to defend and to win. Uh, but then something called the Civil Rights Establishment, derailed the Civil Rights Movement. And the term Civil Rights Leader came to mean something new and, uh, and something ominous. Uh, whereas the old Civil Rights Movement looked to America's founding principles as, as its guide, uh, the new Civil Rights Establishment seemed to hold America and all that, it's, all that it stands for in contempt. Uh, it also redefined civil rights in a way that set up a zero-sum game uh, in regard to rights. Uh, one group uh, can't gain civil rights according to its way, uh, its way of thinking unless another group surrenders civil rights. Uh, and I think we've seen the dangerous side of this way of thinking uh, in recent elections with ads um, supporting Democratic candidates uh, that don't seem to have any other purpose uh, than to incite racial hatred among black Americans. Uh, well, our speaker this morning is a tireless enemy of the civil rights establishment uh, that has turned the idea of civil rights on its head. Uh, his name is Jesse, uh, but after uh, he founded an event called the National Day of Repudiation of Jesse Jackson and then uh, founded a drive to boycott the NAACP, uh, he became known widely as the anti-Jesse. Uh, Reverend Jesse Lee Peterson is the president of the national nonprofit organization called BOND, uh, which stands for the Brotherhood Organization for a New Destiny. He operates the BOND Home for Boys, which is a program to address the urban crisis in America through character building after school programs. He's a board member of the California Christian Coalition and of the National Grassroots Alliance. Uh, he's written several books. Uh, including From Rage to Responsibility, Black Leadership's Role in America's Demise, and Government's War on the Family. Uh, he's a radio talk show host, uh, and he's on TV a lot on shows like um, uh, Hannity and Combs and BET Tonight. He's a man who reminds us of what the term civil rights leader ought to mean and properly understood what it still means and will always, me uh, and will always mean. Uh, please join me in welcoming the Reverend Jesse Lee Peterson. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. Uh, I really do appreciate that. I brought one of the young men with me from Bonn and uh, one of his responsibilities is to come down and take some pictures. And he just said to me, I'm nervous about going down to take pictures. And I said, you think you're nervous? I have to go up there and speak after the president. So <laughs> uh, really, I'm glad you didn't walk out. <laughs> one of the uh, fears of a speaker is when the president is speaking, everybody may get up and walk out. But thank you for not walking out. I appreciate it. I, um, when I um, received the invitation to come here to speak, I could not believe it. It's like a dream come true for me. And I kept thinking that they were going to call us back and cancel the engagement. <laughs> so it's a, it's a joy for me to be here. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're doing 
And then I want to take some questions and answers from you. I like communicating with the people. Um, I am founder, as you said, and president of a national nonprofit organization called Bond, the Brotherhood Organization of a New Destiny. And our purpose is to rebuild the family by rebuilding a man. We've been around now for about 13 years or so. And I started the organization because I realized that most black folks, not all of course, but most, are suffering not due to racism, but the lack of moral character. Most blacks are immoral today. And they are made to be that way by the um, uh, Jesse Jackson. You ever heard of Jesse Jackson? <laughs> <coughs> They are made to be that way by Jesse Jackson, the NAACP, the uh, Congressional Black Caucus, which is the most racist organization in America today. Uh, people like Maxine Waters. How about Maxine? You heard of her? How would you like to be married to her? <laughs> uh, the uh, National Organization of Women Who Hate Men and the ACLU Who Hate America. What, what they have done over the last 30 to 40 years, they have deliberately kept blacks down in order to gain power and wealth and to destroy America. And this started about 40 years ago when the government came in and told black Americans that we owe you something. We're going to pay you back for slavery, for what you have gone through. But you can't have this payback unless you take the fathers out of the home. And so they decided, all right, we're going to take the fathers out. And the government became the daddy of the family. And as you know, for the most part, the government is anti-God, anti-family, and anti-country. And 40 years later, you have most black people who are anti-God, anti-America, and anti-family. Because the government has just really taken every bit of the character away from them. They depend on the government more than anything else in life. They'll kill for the government. And I want to tell you that it wasn't like that uh, before the Civil Rights Movement. I grew up on a plantation down in Alabama, right outside of Montgomery, Alabama. And uh, at the time, the laws were against black Americans. But my grandparents and my parents, I worked in the plantation. There was a, a sense of respect for what is right, a sense of respect for one another. People depended on each other because we didn't have the government or anyone else to depend on. And as a result of that, there was a high standard of living in the black community. And I want to remind you that while growing up on the plantation in Alabama, not one time did I hear my grandfather or my, my grandmother or anyone put down white Americans. They didn't blame them for their problem. They didn't tell us we should hate them, but they taught us to work hard and to do what's right, treat people fairly, and what you put out will come back on you. And that's the way we live. But once the civil rights movement started, it all changed. And now we have the destruction that we have here. We also have a home for boys uh, from the age of about 13 to 25. And these boys are coming from juvenile detention centers. Some of them we are getting before they get into the system. And the first thing that we show the boys is how to overcome their anger. They must drop their anger. They have to forgive their parents because when you have anger within you, wrong seem right and right seem wrong. And, and, and when you are angry, people use you for their own personal gain. And that's what the so-called civil rights leaders do. They are good at looking at America and finding problems and telling black people this is why you can't make it. Because they understand that if they can keep blacks in, in anger, if they can keep them upset, they can use them for whatever they need them for. So we try to get the boys to get over their anger. They have to work, they pay rent, uh, uh, they have to finish school if they haven't finished school yet. And I tell you, I, we have seen good success over the last 13 years or so. And I'm proud to tell you that we have not received one penny from the government, nor have we asked for a penny from the government. Thank you. Can I get some water up here? That's right. My mouth is a little dry here. And uh, these boys are doing quite well. I want you to quickly meet one of them. He doesn't have to say anything, but come up here, Derek, for a minute. This is Derek Swanee. He came to us about a year ago. <laughs> he was a little nervous right now. Uh, 
Uh, he was 19, he just turned 19, 19 recently, but Derek came to us, he didn't have a father in the home, and his mother wasn't around a lot because she was very young when he was born. And Derek had a rough life, but we brought him in, taught him how to get over his anger, forgive his parents, because if we don't love our parents, we're not gonna ever know how to love God. And Derek has just recently graduated from a Toyota Audio Automotive Training Center. So if you need your car worked on, you can see Derek. <laughs> Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> and a lot of you guys are good guys. They're just angry because they feel that no one loved them. I grew up on, as I said, I grew up on a plantation in Alabama, and but I grew up without my father. My dad wasn't in the home. Long story short, my father got my mother pregnant when she was very young, and when she told him about it, he denied it. So my mother became very angry and didn't want anything to do with my father. And I, I was raised up without my dad. And I remember growing up as a kid, I had this longing for my father. Uh, it's like something was missing in my life, and I knew it was for my dad. So whenever I would ask my mother about him, where's my father, why don't he come and get me? You know, why, where is he? She would say, you know, he doesn't love you, forget about your father, he doesn't care about you. And as a kid, I became very angry at my dad, at my mother, because she seemed mean to me. And I have to tell you, my mother tried hard to turn us away from my father. And the worst thing that can happen to a child, the worst thing that can happen, whether it's male or female, black or white, is to turn them away from their fathers. Because when you turn kids away from their fathers, you turn them away from God. And it's not that the man is God, but he represents God in the home. There is a spiritual order to life, and that order is God in Christ, Christ in man, man over woman and woman over children. And when you have that spiritual order together, you have a better chance for life. But well, whenever that father is not there, it, it just it leaves the mother and the children open for the world to come in and take over. And that's what's happening. But anyway, I, um, I was, I, I, for a long time I was a liberal, I was a Democrat, and I apologize for that because I, I repented it and I'm over that now. <laughs> I mean, Conservative Republican. All right, I need to get some water here. Sorry about that. I'm a Republican. The worst thing that you could be in the black community is a Republican and conservative. It's, it's probably easier to be a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Than <laughs> but anyway, I, uh, so the way I changed is that, um, um, you know, I was very angry because my father wasn't there and I was angry at my mother for trying to turn me away from my dad. Long story short, again, I'm right, I, um, I ended up on welfare because I was told that if you use drugs that... Um, uh, and you're black in America, that you could go down to the welfare office and just tell them that, you know, you're unable to work and that they would give you money and stuff. So as a young man, I ran down to the welfare office and I told them that I was smoking marijuana and I wasn't able to work. And uh, anybody ever smoke marijuana? You're not going to confess it here, huh? <laughs> and, uh, they gave me $300 in food stamp, uh, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, $300 in cash, $100 food stamps. They paid my rent. They gave me free medical coverage. And for a number of years, I just parted using that. And I, I realized that I had gotten worse in life rather than getting better. Then I, uh, I started to look, what, you know, why can't I be a man? Why can't I stand up? Then I started to go to some of the churches around the Los Angeles area there, some of the larger churches. And if I named them, you would recognize them. And instead of the preachers showing me how to overcome my anger, they said it was racism, it's a white man, they're trying to hold you back. And then I started listening to the NAACP and Louis Farrakhan and others, and they too were saying the same thing. And so I became very resentful toward white Americans. I started hating them because I couldn't understand as a young man why were they trying to hold me back. And as you know, when you hate somebody, it comes back on you. And I just got worse. Long story short, again, 
I'm riding in my car one day and I'm thinking, you know, I know that I could have a better life. How do I get over this, this stuff that I'm in? And so I'm riding in my car and um, I turned the radio on and I heard a Jewish minister say that if you want to be free, if you want to know God, when you pray, go into your prayer closet, be still and know the truth. Just let the truth catch up with you. And I was desperate to know the truth at the time. So I went home that night, not knowing what to expect. And I sat in my, uh, in my bedroom there quietly because normally when I would pray to God, I was always begging for something. Uh, oh Lord, bless my mama, bless my daddy, give me a house, give me some money, give me a wife. You know, I learned to stop asking God for a wife. Because every woman that he gave me, I couldn't handle her. So, <laughs> so I stopped doing that. I just kind of wait and let him add that on to me. But anyway, I'm sitting there quietly asking nothing of God but wanting to know the truth. And all of a sudden, I realized that I resented my parents. And it was resentment of my parents that was holding me back. And that's why the world had dumped all this other stuff on me. And I wept for that. I felt so sad that I hated my parents because I realized in that moment that they couldn't help themselves, that what had happened to, to me had happened to them, and it was wrong for me to hate them because that hatred that I had was holding me back. And so I had to apologize to them because God said that when you forgive others, he will forgive you, right? My mother came to California, I'm about 38 at the time, and uh, she came there to visit her sister, went there to visit her sister, and I knew I had to go to my mother to apologize. And the closer I got to my aunt's house, fear just overtook me. Here I am, 38 years old. I'm thinking, why am I afraid of my mother? Why can't I just say I'm sorry? But I remembered as a kid, every time I tried to speak up, she would make me doubt myself. You know, shut up, you're being disobedient, I'm the mother. So she took away my courage. But anyway, I went into the house there, and we went into the bedroom. And I said to my mom, I said, you know, all of my life I resented you because you tried to turn me away from my father. You were never patient with me. And that hatred have caused me to become just like you. And I said that I'm sorry for that. You know, I realize now that I, I'm wrong for hating you. And fortunate for me, my mother apologized. And for the first time in my life, she told me about her life. And exactly what she had done to me was done to her by her mother. And so it seemed, it seemed to go on from generation to generation. That's why we got to restore the family. But when I forgave my mother, God forgave me. And all the fear, the doubt, the worry, the insecurity, that void that I had, it all left. It just, and God gave me perfect peace. And 13 years have gone by, and I'm better for it today than any other time in history. And I've gone through more in the last 13 years than I had in my whole life. I realized from that that, wow, it's not the white man that's holding black Americans back. It's our leaders, it's Jesse Jackson and others, that we have been lied to. And I thought, how can I let black people know this? Called a friend up and told them what I wanted to do. We had our meeting, and from that we started bond. I told them what I just told you. Next day I knew I was on Phil Donahue, Gerardo. The LA Times did a story on us, and one thing led to another one. And then I thought, how can I get this message into the black community even more so? So we bought some airtime on a Christian radio station called KTYM in Inglewood, California, right in the heart of the black community. So I go on radio and I say to black people, it is not the white man that's holding us back. We've been lied to by most of the black preachers who are not called by God but by their mama. And that we've been lied by the civil rights leaders. And I said that what we have to do is drop our anger take control of our own life, and then things will get better. And we opened up the lines, people calling in, and I'm thinking, wow, they are as happy as I am to know that you could be free, right? People call in, they would, they, they would call me nigger, you're a nigger, you're a sellout, Uncle Tom, you hate yourself, you hate your mama, you hate your daddy. They called me names that I had never heard of before. And I'm like, what is that? And then it got to a point, they kept saying, you're just a white man's boy, the white man is paying you to do this. And whenever they would say that the white man is paying me to do it, I would say, hold on for a minute, let me do a commercial break right here. If there are white people out there that would pay me to do this, here's my phone number. <laughs> <laughs>
Because if I'm going to go through this kind of hell that can get paid for it, why not? <laughs> I, I haven't had one offer yet. Anybody take up that offer? <laughs> Um, we have, I was eventually banned from that radio station, and over the last 13 years, I've been banned from three radio stations in the Los Angeles area there because they hate the truth. They love lies and hate the truth, and anybody that comes along and tells them the truth, they see the truth as the enemy. But I love the truth, and we have to tell it. We hold what we call the National Day of Repudiation of Jesse Jackson. That is so much fun, huh? <laughs> I, uh, 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 every year on Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday, we have a big rally right in front of Jesse Jackson's Rainbow Push office in Los Angeles. And we bring in speakers, and we have picket signs, and, and we just had our fourth annual National Day of Repudiation. And we're going to do it every year until Jesse Jackson repents or black Americans wake up. And I don't see Jesse Jackson repenting soon, so I have a, a lifetime job. I, I have a job for life. But uh, we do it on Dr. King's birthday because we want to show the contrast between Dr. King's dream and Jesse Jackson's nightmare. Dr. King said that one day black America would be judged by contents of character and not color. Well, Jesse Jackson's nightmare is that black Americans are judged by their color because most of them lack character. And I'll give you two examples. 70%, 70 percent, 70 percent of black babies are born out of wedlock today. 70%, and you don't hear an outcry about it from the churches or the so-called civil rights leaders. When I was growing up on the plantation, if a woman had a baby out of wedlock, it uh, got pregnant, it was an embarrassment to the family. As a matter of fact, my mother got married to my stepfather before I was born because it was an embarrassment to be pregnant and not have a husband. Or they would have to have a shotgun wedding. I remember when I first started dating, one of my worst fears was to get someone pregnant because I didn't want to get married. So it prevented me from getting involved sexually before marriage. Nowadays, when black women get pregnant, they have baby showers, they invite people over, and the man is nowhere around. No husband, no boyfriend, nothing around. There's no shame about it. One other example, 90%, 90% of black Americans voted for Bill Clinton twice. Twice. They vote for the Democratic Party, a party that is uh, anti-family, they support homosexuality, they support abortion, and since the early 70s, over 13 million black babies have been murdered inside the black woman's womb since the early 70s. 13 million just inside the black woman's womb. You don't hear an outcry about that. Dr. King did not sacrifice his life for that kind of lifestyle. Uh, uh, Dr. King said that one day we would become one nation under God. Jesse Jackson's nightmare is that we are more divided today as a race than any other time in history. And we've got to stand up. We've got to do something now before it's too late. The media has protected him. Jesse Jackson is an evil man. He's wicked. He's not of God. He's of his father, the devil. And we must understand that. If Jesse Jackson was a white man doing and saying the same thing, we would be up in arms about it. America would be protesting and you know, refusing to allow this guy to control. But because he's black and you're afraid of being called a racist, he can get away with it. Our warfare is spiritual. It's good versus evil, right versus wrong. It is not black versus white or white versus black. It's good versus evil, and we need to realize that. Let's see here. Black people can talk a long time. I got five minutes to wind this down and take your question. <laughs> um, I want to tell you about a lawsuit, and then I want to talk about affirmative action, then I'll take some questions. Um, last year, year before last now, as you know, Jesse Jackson has been going around the country shaking down corporate Americans, you know, intimidating them, accusing them of being a racist if they don't do what he wants them to do. Well, he intimidated Toyota Motors, and Toyota caved in and agreed to pay $700 million into the black community starting last year. Well, Toyota had a meeting in Los Angeles uh, late last year now, 
and they invited all the organizations and the preachers and people to come and hear this presentation. And so we got this invitation to come out for the presentation. I went, not really knowing what to expect, and I almost did not go to the meeting, but I went. And when I got there, there were about 200 or so black people there, mostly preachers and businessmen, and Jesse Jackson was there. And I ended up sitting right in front of Jesse Jackson. The table, just a little table that separated us. And I'm like, oh, there is a God. Thank you, God. And I couldn't believe it. And uh, so the meeting started. Jesse Jackson went up to the podium. And he said, the laws that the attorney general is passing to go after bin Laden are really laws to go after the black leaders. And when he said that, people applauded, and amen, and you know, praise the Lord for that. It's a lie, but they praise the Lord on it anyway. Then uh, he told about his trade bureau. If you want to get money from these organizations, I encourage you to join my trade bureau. And, and according to how much money you make, you have to pay him anywhere between 250 to $2,500 a year in order to get benefits from these companies. Everybody applauded. Uh, long story short, the guy from Toyota got up and uh, he did about a 20 minute presentation. Then he opened it up for questions and answers. And so I raised my hand and I told him about my organization, about the home for boys. And I said to him, is there any way that we can go directly to you without having to go through Jesse Jackson or anybody that's connected with Jesse Jackson, I said, because we don't agree with anything that Jesse Jackson is about. <laughs> and I have to tell you, when I said that, all hell broke loose. <laughs> really, it is easier to deal with the Crips and the Bloods than it is with preachers and civil rights leaders. <laughs> But all hell, they started screaming at me, calling me names, telling me that I was a sit down, you're a nigger, you're a sellout, I can't believe it. I mean, just all over the room. And that was a, a judge, Greg Mathis there from the uh, TV show, the judge show, a black guy. And uh, he screamed at me from across the room, sit down, you've been watching too much Bill O'Reilly, sit down. <laughs> and so I just yelled back at him and I said, well, at least I'm not watching your boring show. <laughs> That did not help my case at all, <laughs> not at all. So I think yelling and screaming, and uh, at this point, uh, Jonathan Jackson and some guys came and sat near me trying to intimidate me for the remainder of the meeting. And uh, Jesse Jackson went back to the podium, and he said that black conservatives are parasites. And whenever I shake the tree and the fruits fall to the ground, they're there to pick them up. And people applauded, and you know, like right on. And so, uh, long story short, the media ended, and I'm standing at the coffee table while one of my guys gives some information about my organization to Toyota. Uh, Jonathan Jackson, Jesse Jackson's son, came from across the room to where I'm standing, and he was so mad at me, he hit me. And I'm like, what are you doing? You can't hit me. This is against the law, right? And while he and I are talking about this issue, and, uh, Jesse Jackson came over, and he started cursing me out. I mean, just literally saying words that I didn't even say when I was a sinner, just cursing. And uh, Judge Gray Mathis came over and he was yelling, where's, uh, where's O'Reilly now? You're always on Bill O'Reilly show, where's O'Reilly when you need him? And I found myself in circuit around a group of people yelling and screaming, threatening to literally kill me. And I have to tell you, I had a, a flashback on when I was growing up in Alabama. And I remember when they integrated the all white school for the first time. And I saw these little black kids going to the school and they had to walk this line of angry white people calling them names. And I felt fear for those kids because I thought they would get hurt. Well, I had a flashback of that because I thought at one point that they were going to take me out. That's how mean and nasty they were. There were no cameras there, so they figured that they can just do whatever they want. Fortunately, fortunately for us, we had a, a tape recorder, so we have it on tape. But. Uh, <laughs> Um, see how smart I got? He like worked through us, right? <laughs> but, uh, uh, and so someone said to my guy, you better get him out of here before we kill him, you know. So they finally got me out of the crowd. And um, as a result of that, I called my friend Larry Clayman over at Judicial Watch. You ever heard of Larry? <laughs> yeah. And I told Larry what had happened there. And we filed a civil rights lawsuit 
against Jesse Jackson, uh, his son Jonathan, Judge Gray Mathis, and others at that meeting. And I have to tell you that these people are going to pay for what they've done. They're, they have no respect for physical laws or spiritual laws. And until we start dealing with them, they're not going to stop. And so they're going to pay. I want finance from it, but most of all, I want America to see that these people are evil. And if we love good, that good is stronger than evil. And if we stand up against them, we should stop what's happening in our country today. That's what I want. And you, you have my word, you have my word that we're not going to settle behind closed doors. You will know what's happening. We're not, I want you to see that this man is evil, but he's also a coward. He's not what he seemed to be. And do not allow yourself to be intimidated by him or Maxine Waters or any of the other, other people. I want to just say uh, uh, about affirmative action, you know, there's a, a U US, Supreme, United, U.S. Supreme Court is deciding on um, um, affirmative action here in Michigan. And, you know, anybody with any common sense know that affirmative action is wrong. You know, it just doesn't take much to know that. It's just wrong. It's wrong. And I'm going to give you a quick uh, three reasons why. One reason is that when you, uh, I work with a lot of black boys and girls who have gotten into these universities simply because they're black. Over at the University of Michigan right now, if you're black or Hispanic, you get something like 20 points just for being black, right? You don't get anything for being white. And then you get 12 points, I believe, for a high SAT score. There's something wrong with that. But a lot of these boys and girls are getting in, and because they have not earned their way, they end up dropping out, feeling worse about themselves than they did before they went into the school. Uh, so that's not fair to them. I work, we, our organization works with all races. We have a young man right now at Princeton. Uh, this is his second year there. He's maintaining a three-point something average. And that is because he worked hard. He do the time. He put in the work. Now, he happens to be white, but it would be unfair that he worked all his life to get into the school. He go there. He can't get in simply because he's white. He's going to let some black kid in or some Hispanic kid based on color. This is wrong. I know what discrimination is, and you don't try to solve one uh, problem by creating another. You know, you do it by teaching people to work hard and do what's right and take care of themselves, and then a change will come. I want to encourage you to stand against this. I am an American. I'm not Afro-American. I am 100% American. 100%. 100%. And I thank God for that. I wouldn't want to be in Africa or anywhere else but here. Everybody and their mama trying to come here, I don't see anyone trying to leave. We can't, e <laughs> we can't even keep the illegals out. They're coming by the thousands. And so it's time that we stand up for our country. It's time that we rebuild the family and teach all Americans to love their country. And the way that we do that is by telling the truth. We must tell the truth because it's the truth that's going to set us free. All right, I want to take some questions from you. Yes, ma'am. Oh, hi. I live in Detroit, and um, during the last election, the NAACP sent me five pieces of campaign literature that were based on the lynching in Texas. And it said, vote, don't go back to the past, show the truck, chains, the daughter of yep. the man who was killed, which was very tragic. I called the NAACP and I said, look, I've given you money. I don't like this. You know, I don't think this is the kind of campaigning we should do. And they gave me the number of the educational wing. And I called them up and I said, I have your literature here. I, w I tried to find it. I, they're color, full color. I mean, it cost a fortune to blanket our neighborhood with this yep. stuff. Yep. And I called the educational group and I said, who do I vote for? Who's going to take us back to the past? And she hung up on me. Why would, and I'm saying, how do we fight this? I mean, the, it's just incredible. Why would you give money to the NAACP? Hold on to that uh, mic. <laughs> Hold on to that mic there. Don't run. Well, it was, <laughs> <laughs> Why would you give money? It's like giving money to, would you give money? Because I respected them in the 60s. In the 60s? Yeah. That's been I'm so old. long I'm ago. Old. I'm old. 
Isn't this 2003? I don't understand. Really, I can't understand why a person, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to put you down, but I don't know why you, it's like giving money to the Ku Klux Klan's. You know, yeah. I would just call them, I would have called them up and say, look, I would never support you again. You know, you're a racist organization, I won't support this kind of stuff. Tell them the truth, but don't, don't finance. You are financing your own destruction when you give to the NAACP. And one of the reasons that they do it, they want to keep blacks angry. They drive around the country looking for problems. They look for the Confederate flag and say, look, this is a racist flag. Black people get mad without even thinking about it, and whatever they want them to do, they would do it. But don't, do not support those type of organizations. Yes, sir. In Incidentally, I also live in Detroit, and I <clears throat> received that blanket mailing of racist literature before the election, and I was outraged, and of course, we, the reason it was a blanket mailing, because we know that all Detroiters must be black, right? Yeah. Apparently. <laughs> uh, I, I uh, met you through talk radio over 10 years ago, <clears throat> and I've admired you for a long time. Well, thank you. A and uh, I, I'm just curious to know, how, what is your impression being from California and a little separated from all these different communities which have lar uh, cities which have large black communities, how do you look at Detroit as far as the racial relations situation compared to the other cities that you probably have been guests on, talk radio and various other contacts? Um, Detroit is so bad that I'm afraid to go into Detroit City at night by myself and I'm a black man. And I have to tell you, the reason for that is because of the leaders of these inner cities. You know, most of the inner cities, uh, they're, they're headed up by black mayors, city councils are black, the police chiefs are black. Uh, but when you look at the cities, they're falling apart. And the reason for that is that they're taking the monies and putting it in their pockets rather than rebuilding the city, rather than putting these young boys and girls um, who are committing crime in, in jail so they understand that it don't pay to do crime. You know, they, they, don't want, they don't want the community to be better. They want it the way it is so that they can use black Americans for their own personal gain. We saw that during the L.A. riot. Um, uh, after the L.A. riot, the government put in a lot of money into Los Angeles, the Los Angeles area there. But when you drive through South Central Los Angeles, even today, it looked like a ghetto because the money went into the pockets of the people. So it's not going to change until black Americans take control of their own, leader, own, own life. They don't need leaders. A quick note, I did a debate on uh, reparations, uh, and I debated Michael Eric Dyson. And you know what reparations is, right? They want some more money for, for slavery. And uh, I debated a professor, Michael Eric Dyson, from the University of Pennsylvania. And I said in that debate, what we need are fathers and mothers to get married, guide their children, make sure they get a good education. And I said, reparation would not solve the problem. I said to them that if all white people were to leave this country and say to black America, you can have the United States of America, we're going to leave. We're going back to wherever white people come. Where did you guys come from? <laughs> <laughs> We're going back, right? And they said, uh, I said that if they all left and leave us with this country, in 10 years, America would be a ghetto. America, the United States of America would be a ghetto because it's not the lack of material things that we're missing, but it's the lack of moral character. And that's what we have to rebuild. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, you've, uh, I just finished a book by uh, James Q. Wilson about uh, the marriage problem and how our culture in general is not building families, both yes. white and black. I thought it was interesting that he brought up the point that yes, slavery had a great deal to breaking up the black family, but the welfare, uh, at least I'm reading between the lines, is the new slavery. And if it is the new slavery, are not Maxine Waters and the Jesse Jacksons the, <clears throat> what can you charitably call the house slaves? of the establishment? They are the slaves of black, they are the slave owners, the new slave owners of black Americans, that's for sure. I want to add that slavery is not the reason black people are suffering today, because had that been true, we would have seen more of the same happening before the Civil Rights Movement. 
but we saw less then than we do today. So it is not slavery, it's the slave owners, which are the civil rights leaders in the Democratic Party. That, those people are the problem, not white Americans overall. I'll take what, one more. Oh. One, yeah, yes, Hi there. Um, you do a great job with Bill O'Reilly, by the way. Oh, um, thank I've seen you. you a ton of times. Um, you if know, you can deal with Bill O'Reilly, you can handle anybody. He scares, yeah. <laughs> he scares the crap out of me, and I'm just watching him on television. He's terribly yeah. <laughs> intimidating. Yep. Um, you know, unfortunately, you're just a long list of black men that come out as conservatives, and then you're unfortunately, you know, vilified. You know, Cullen Powell and Clarence Thomas yeah. and. Um, you know, it's, it's almost like we feel like as white people and also black conservatives, you're swimming upstream. It's like, what can we do? I mean, what That's a as good question. You know, individuals can we do to kind of reverse this without sounding like racist? Because good. then we're labeled as racist, of course. So, Well, the first thing that you could do is to love God with all your heart, soul, and might. Love him. And, and when you love God, when you love God with all your heart, soul, and might, he's going to work through you. And you're going to be able to tell the truth about any given situation. You're going to, when they call you a racist, you're going to say, you know what, you can call me whatever you want. But here's the reality to this deal here. And I'm not a racist. You know, Christ had to go through it for the truth. Why shouldn't we have to go through it too? And I want to encourage all the white Americans, let them call you a racist. That's fine. They're only calling you a racist because they want to control you, you know, and, and the moment you give in to their intimidation, they're going to get what they want from you. It's like being married. You ever been married before? <laughs> you know, I remember when I used to date a lot, my girlfriend controlled me all the time. And the way that she controlled me was through my emotions. You know, if she wanted something from me, she would say, oh, you're so wonderful. You're so handsome. You know, my ego get puffed up, even though she's lying to me, right? I feel... <laughs> I like the lies. The ego love lies. And so the moment she tell me I'm wonderful, she can get whatever she wants. But if, if I don't give in to it, I say, no, 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 I'm not going to do it. Then she say, you're no good. You're not handsome anyway. <laughs> then I get mad. And the moment I, I get angry, I feel guilty. And in order to get rid of the guilt, I got to buy what she wants, right? Well, that's how, that's how they control us through our emotion keeping us angry, bringing us up and down. But God said that if we were born again, overcome our pride, overcome our ego, we'll be able to do what's right. Not what we feel, but what is right. And I encourage you to do that. Tell the truth and let them call you whatever they may. It doesn't bother me at all. And I was a coward before God changed my life. But when I was born again, he put a bubble around me, a protective bubble. And now words doesn't bother me at all. I already know my flaws, right? So call me whatever you want, but I'm still going to tell the truth. And that's what I encourage you to do. Tell the truth, and the truth will bring on a change. All right, I, only, I think I can only take one more. Is that right? Okay. I'm sorry, sir. Yes, sir. I read a book uh, about a year ago that uh, echoed a lot of your sentiments on... Uh, Jesse Jackson, I don't recall, something about a corp, shakedown of corporate America. The book is called Shakedown by Tim, 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 Kemp, Kenneth, what's that, oh my God, I'm getting old all of a sudden. Well, I, I was just But the book is called Shakedown. Shakedown, you might be able to find it at the bookstore. I'm yes, you can. Thank you. Excellent book. I mean, when you read that book and you read about Jesse Jackson's life, it's, I mean, if had, been, had it been any other person on this earth, they would be in jail today. Really. This man is evil. It's evil. In closing, I want to say thank you so much for having me here. I do appreciate it. I want you to know that within all of us who love God with all our heart, soul, and might, we have a greater power within us. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. The people on the left do not have God on their side. They, that's why they try to intimidate us. We, as Americans, have a responsibility. This is the greatest country in the world. There's nowhere else to go. And we cannot afford to allow ourselves to be intimidated uh, by these people. And I want to encourage you to stand, stand, stand. And when you have done all you could do to stand, stand some more. God bless you, and thank you very much.